Hi, I'm Andrew Rodriguez, and welcome to Psycho Bible, Battling about psychology and theology. I just want to do a video reflecting on some recent things uh, in my life, in society, uh, about our freedoms, and the type of world that is emerging right now. Uh, first, there was uh, last month my one of my uncles uh, he passed away, and. At the funeral, I got to thinking, and I was I posted something on, on social media reflecting on it, and my Uncle Bob, I didn't know him too well, uh, but he was one of the good uncles that uh, we spent some time with here and there growing up, so I remember some, some things about him, you know, just his dry wit, and uh, some things that really stood out at the funeral were... the work ethic he had and how he just looking over his life he really seemed to reflect the American dream uh, patriotic he served in the military I forget which branch but he, he served in Vietnam I don't think he was drafted I think he actually enlisted he was a helicopter mechanic and I think he also was a machine gunner on a helicopter so I can't imagine the stuff he saw and how that might have impacted him but he's a man who just was a hard worker. He trained his kids to be hard workers. Uh, I see it in my cousins. And think about his patriotism. I remember back when uh, he lived in Jersey, my, him and his son, my cousin Jamie, they had a uh, landscaping business. And uh, they, Jamie was doing some advertising for it, and it was called America's Best Landscaping and Lawn Care. It was just... Everything was about America. They just they were living that, that American dream by their hard work. And yeah, he went through a lot of difficulties, difficulties with his family, with, uh, with his health as well. And not, not one to complain, just push through it, persevere, and set a good example to his kids of what hard work looks like and uh, having that stoic attitude toward difficulty. And as I was reflecting after the funeral, I said, you know what? He kind of represents everything that the left hates. The social justice warriors, the woke left, the uh, politically correct authoritarians, everything they hate about America, he kind of represented. The, that work ethic, the love for, for country, uh, the ability to push through difficulty without complaining and expecting someone else to take care of things for you but just to pull yourself up by your own bootstraps or by working together with your family and your close community but not expecting the government to to give you handouts but to just try to make it on your own and and do right by your family and to serve in your local church and to love god and country all those things he represented those things and those are the very things that are uh, the institutions that this the woke mob is trying to destroy right now. So that was my reflection last month. And then this week, uh, it was Pearl Harbor Day. And you don't see any mentions of it anywhere on social media. It was you know, just, it just sort of floated by. And I happened to go jogging in my hometown, or the... Uh, in the town where I live, and we have a, a, a memorial park. We have memorials to, well, uh, those who gave their lives in various wars, not just World War II. Uh, we have a big, big memorial to, to World War II soldiers uh, from our town here in Pennsylvania, in Pottstown. Uh, there was one as well for, for Vietnam. And I saw this engraving on the Vietnam m Memorial, and I took a photo of it. It says, no person was ever honored for what he received. Honor has been the reward for what he gave. And I took that photo and I posted it, and as I was reflecting on it, I was like, you know what, this generation does not understand this. They don't get that. They look at honor that others have received, and they say it must be because of privilege, which for them... The definition of privilege is unearned advantages that based on your group identity. 
And so what they're now doing is trying to demand honor based on their group identity as, as a marginalized group. Or try to be an ally to other marginalized group and, and thus vicariously obtain honor that way as someone who's virtuous. So it just I've been reflecting on this, this culture war that's been occurring over, well, it's been occurring incrementally over decades, but it's been ramping up over the past several years, especially in the form of identity politics. And I've said this in other videos. It's one of my theses I've, I've had about the culture war, the nature of it, is that what I've been noticing is a return to honor-shame culture dynamics. But it's a twisted version. And most people don't, might not even know what I'm talking about because we don't talk about honor shame culture versus innocent guilt culture that much. It's kind of new terminology. I came across honor shame dynamics several years ago because, as a therapist, especially one who works with people dealing with addiction and abuse, particularly sexual abuse, shame is the big thing that we are dealing with. And I wanted to have a truly biblical understanding of what shame is. And so I, I began doing a deeper study into the shame and the nature of it and came across um, honorshame.com, which uh, is a website that uh, helps contextualize the gospel for those in majority world cultures. The majority world operates using an honor shame uh, framework for understanding what is right, what is wrong, what is worthwhile, for uh, what are cultural expectations and standards. And what was very clear to me is, wait a second, the Bible is written in and to an honor-shame culture. So to really understand God's Word, you have to understand honor-shame culture dynamics. And they're still present today in the Middle East, in uh, most cultures in the Southern Hemisphere, in uh, Eastern Asia. So it's the Western world that has sort of diverged more from honor shame. And what I believe is honor shame is kind of the default for a culture. And we have learned in the West that to make a society that's made of people from a variety of backgrounds, especially one that's very syncretistic and pluralistic, you'll need some rules and some law and order. And so we've developed innocent guilt cultures, but they're built on top of honor shame. I'm going to get into this more in future videos, more in depth. But let me just go back to what is a true honor shame culture. The core value is honor. Now what is honor? It's the acknowledgement of one's value by one's community. When the community recognizes that you have worth, they're bestowing honor upon you. So this honor is not something that you derive from within yourself. It's, it's given to you from the community or from someone in authority uh, in the community. And it's usually going to be due to some contribution that you give to the community by some feat of excellence or by solving a problem or just being one of the people that can maintain things. There's a way of life in the community and if you're one of the ones who uh, can, can be dependable and reliable to maintain the culture and those, those norms uh, and those mores, then there's a degree of honor bestowed upon you. But if you can do something even more excellent that uh, will bring more wealth or property to the community and uh, more uh, nourishment and uh, esteem from other communities, then you will receive more honor. And so primarily what is good or right is determined by what brings the most honor to the community. What does not bring honor to the community would be things like victimhood and weakness. In fact, those, those are not causes for honor, but rather for shame. So shame would be the removal of honor or the absence of honor. Is anything about you that makes you unacceptable to the community. So those are the dynamics that we see in true honor-shame cultures, but what we're seeing with the social justice movement 
is there is a demand for honor that's not based on any sort of merit, any sort of excellence or achievement, but rather based on victimhood or marginalization status. And you're seeing it in all aspects of life, whether it's based on race, body type, you're seeing a, a movement now to, uh, to attack the fitness industry and the health and diet industry and uh, any science based on there being foods that are healthier and that there's such a thing as junk food. They're saying that those are systems of oppression to say that there's such a thing as junk food. It's getting into every little aspect because, well, I may lose honor because I'm not in shape or because I'm obese. So instead of saying, well, maybe I can change that, maybe I can take some personal responsibility for my health and my weight and uh, my fitness, we'll just, no, let's attack the social norms and reverse the hierarchy. It's playing out in so many areas, and what's most clear is the, the increasing demands for Marxism that we're seeing in, in America, of all places. The, the demand that there be uh, universal whatever, health care, basic income, um, all in the name of equality. There needs to be income equality. There needs to be redistribution of wealth. Well, all this is is so that uh, wealth would be distributed. It's a weird way to talk about wealth, but I'll get to that. It would be distributed not based on merit, on what you earn, but on uh, victimhood status, on historical victimhood or marginalization. And so there's such a demand for the government to care for you. And that is how we'll get our honor. I will be honored, not based on what I do, but on receiving something, uh, in, in a way, if I received hardship or I come from a people group that historically received hardship, then I will receive honor for that, uh, that history. You know, there was a time when the left in the U.S. admired the virtues of hard work and individual responsibility. Like it, I, I've been thinking a lot about how ironic it is that the Democrats used to admire John F. Kennedy, who was probably most known for his, his statement, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. And now you look at the modern Democrats or the modern left uh, in 2020, and it's pretty much exactly the opposite. It's ask not what you can do, but ask how much you can get from your country, how much you can get from the government in entitlements and benefits. Squeeze it dry. So while I'm seeing the social justice warriors try to usher in a new honor-shame system, I'm also seeing the double-edged sword of patronage. Patronage is a hallmark component of honor-shame cultures. It comes from the idea that life is a zero-sum game, meaning that you can get ahead only if you take from others. If I, if I earn some, I, that means I'm taking away from someone else. There's only so much wealth. So they view wealth as a, as a finite entity, uh, and thus for you to get some, it requires you to take it from someone else, that you cannot independently generate wealth. So you can take it from others by choice or by force. And so you make an appeal to someone of a higher status in hopes of them becoming your patron. If they provide for your needs, you will then pay them some sort of tribute. You will pay them honor in exchange for giving them honor and tribute in some way. They will then provide for your needs and you will become dependent on that patron. And that's exactly what we've been seeing culminate in 2020. The activists pushing for a Marxist revolution, demanding we defund the police, are the same ones who want the government to enforce strict lockdowns for COVID-19, the coronavirus. They will readily surrender their freedoms as a tribute to the government if the government will be their patron, providing for all their needs. Uh, this makes me think of uh, what Edward Snowden said in his interview with Joe Rogan back in 2019. I, I love this quote. Patriotism isn't loyalty to the government, it's the commitment to what is good for the people of your country. 
But what we're seeing instead is a, a demand for a police state. And people willingly give up their rights, their liberties, if they know that they'll be kept safe. If they know that whether it's safe from terrorists, you know, if we go back to the Patriot Act, or if it's being kept safe from a virus. Or be kept safe from words that harm us, so we'll get rid of free speech. Uh, we'll get rid of ideas that we don't like, so we'll, we'll uh, have all these rules about what we can teach in universities and what pe ideas people can be exposed to. Uh, we'll uh, remove TV shows and actors and actresses who uh, just don't fit the narrative that uh, will sponsor a cancel culture if that's what it takes. We'll pledge allegiance to some sort of totalitarian regime instead of what would actually be good for the people of our country. But you might be saying, okay, I get the totalitarianism, but why the demands for defunding the police? How does that fit the totalitarian agenda here? Because they want a society-wide reset of power, the Great Reset. You're seeing it everywhere. It's a call for a redistribution of wealth and property, a reversal of hierarchies that gives honor instead to people not based on merit or achievement, but on historical victimhood status. They're playing out their ultimate revenge fantasy. What these social justice warriors call work or labor isn't labor at all. See, true work is a form of self-sacrifice, sacrifice of time, energy, comfort, skills, that brings order to the community, an order that blesses others. It's an actual contribution of some sort. But the work the SJWs claim to do, the woke, what the work that they claim to be doing is emotional labor, like we saw at Evergreen University on an increasingly larger scale. Now we're seeing all throughout our society. It's the work of, of that of an infant crying for nourishment from the mother. It's protest, appealing to the patron, daddy government, mommy government, to meet your demands. That's the work. Protest is it's now deemed work. And demanding um, equity, that everything turn out equal in an outcome. That's the work. Not actually working to get the outcome you want by, by your merits, but actually producing to the level that you wish you, you would have, but instead, well, if I can't achieve that, then I'll demand that I'm given that. And so the double-edged sword is this. Once you make the government the entity, entity to which you pledge as your patron, it can become your tyrant. And you will be satisfied as long as you are given honor you did not earn. Well, you'll be sort of satisfied. You'll be pacified, rather. As long as you get your entitlement benefits, you will continue to pledge loyalty. But it's not a loving loyalty. You will still foster contempt to the system that you depend on while simultaneously complaining that this system oppresses you. An income based on entitlement doesn't bring with it the sense of dignity and self-respect from the income that comes as the fruit of your own hard work. You can take no pride in government handouts. In that redistribution of wealth, if that's not wealth that you earned and that was worth the labor that you did, you cannot take pride in that. And you know it deep down and you will be dissatisfied ultimately. And so you will loathe yourself. But that's too intolerable. It's much easier then to direct that contempt away from self and toward the hand that feeds you. As it's a, that hand that, that's feeding you, it's, it's a perpetual reminder of your infantile dependency, of your shame for not growing into independence, and your shame for not gaining any honor that comes from being a true blessing to others. And that's why I say that this generation does not understand that quote. The true honor is a reward for what you give. It's not something you demand. It's not, it's not based on what you receive. So, just some thoughts, some reflections uh, during Pearl Harbor Day and just thinking about the, 
the direction our society is going in is I pray that we will catch ourselves before we go too far down this path and realize that uh, there's something to recognizing those who earned their place through selfless work, through self-sacrifice. May they be the ones we truly honor, not those who bring glory to themselves or to some people just based on some arbitrary identity, but those who, who work tirelessly to care for others um, and to genuinely make things better and not just destroy a system so they can redistribute everything. All right. If it gave you some, something to think about, then please comment, uh, like, share, subscribe, hit that bell for notifications. And um, if you would like to become part of my email list in case I get booted from the platform, just send me an email. Uh, it's in the description. And I will see you guys soon. God bless.